Good morning, everybody. Um, just by way of explanation, I'm here with uh, Dr. Marianne Gale, who is the Deputy Chief Health Officer, um, and also uh, Zoe Robinson, who is the Advocate for Children and Young People. And in addition, uh, we're honoured to have Alyssa, Alyssa Horan, who is a Year 9 student and is part of the advisory group uh, to, uh, to uh, the Advocate for Children and Young People. Uh, well, the good news is uh, vaccinations, uh, one dose uh, in New South Wales, have reached 82.5%. And two doses, we're now at 53%. So I just want to thank everybody who's coming out in great numbers to make sure that uh, all of us right across our community are kept safe. Tests to 8pm last night, there were 121,661 tests. So again, I want to thank the entire community. It's just amazing how our state, our community have come out and been tested day after day after day. So thank you so much. Uh, locally acquired cases um, to 8pm last night, 1,022 cases. So slightly more than yesterday, but still um, well down on, uh, on the peak numbers that we had about a week ago. Um, the cases uh, predominantly are still in uh, Western Sydney and South Western Sydney but we also have very high fac vaccination rates uh, in South Western Sydney and Western Sydney. Um, and I just want to thank everybody in Western Sydney and South Western Sydney for coming out and getting uh, obviously vaccinated in vast numbers and that is obviously starting to make a real difference for us. So more broadly across the state, everybody's been doing that. So thank you so much. Um, sadly, sadly to 8 p.m. last night, um, we had uh, 10 people pass away um, one, uh, or there were eight men and two women who passed away. One person was in their 50s, one person was in their 60s, two people were in their 70s, five were in their 80s, and one person in the 90s. And I just want to uh, say to their family and friends uh, my very great sympathy to each and every one of you. It's uh, when you have someone from your family or a friend pass away. It certainly is one of the worst moments, I think, in our lives. So to each and every one of those uh, families and friends, my, my condolences and sympathy and condolences on behalf of New South Wales Health as well. Um, lockdowns. Um, uh, unfortunately, we've had some cases in the northern part of the state, um, in uh, Tweed and Byron Bay and Kempsey. And uh, so there will be lockdown arrangements entered into from 5pm this afternoon uh, in each of those local government areas. Um, I have actually spoken with the local members of parliament and uh, other community leaders and uh, there's a general understanding of the need for those lockdowns but it will be initially for seven days um, and it'll be reviewed. Public health will be out um, encouraging obviously testing um, and I certainly, as Health Minister, encourage everybody in those areas to take this very seriously. Um, so far, those areas have been uh, kept relatively safe, but we need the community to keep getting tested so that the public health team can be uh, very, very uh, certain of uh, what we need to do at the expiration of those seven days. So please go, go out and get tested and go and get vaccinated, obviously. Get vaccinated. Vaccinations in those northern areas, uh, Kempsey, uh, Byron Bay, Tweed, it's crucial that you go and get vaccinated. Let's make sure that uh, everybody across our state has the benefit of being safe uh, for themselves, for their family and their friends. Um, what I would I'm quite excited to be uh, able to talk about today is the uh, young people's friends bubble. Um, there's been a lot of work done, uh, um, the advocate for children and young people, uh, young people themselves, um, families generally, have been obviously uh, finding it uh, challenging that uh, young people have not been able to have their friends over. Um, and we know that uh, mental health is a huge issue in this ongoing and certainly dragging on pandemic. Um, so I'm absolutely delighted that Crisis Cabinet um, has accepted the proposition that uh, um, because our vaccination rates have now reached such uh, a high level, um, that uh, it's now acceptable for a limited number of young people to be able to come to one of their friends' houses and to be able to stay there and to 
to do what young people want to do. Um, and Alyssa will tell us a bit more about that and how it might have uh, impacted on her and other young people. But uh, so it'll basically be you can have the same two young people um, coming over to one person. Um, and so that's a bubble of three effectively that uh, will be the friendship group that uh, can be in the house. Of course, not forgetting that uh, we do have the five people, uh, children or adults or what have you, um, outside as well. So there are, um, the larger numbers have been possible outside for quite a while, but this will allow young people to have those, uh, those friendship groups inside their home. Um, but I emphasise that it must be, we've got to be balanced about this, um, it must be in households where the adults are all double vaccinated. So that's a critical issue. Um, we've got to keep our young people as safe as we can. We've got to recognise the need for mental health to be recognised and just socialisation, all those things that young people do as part of their growing up, but also keep them safe. Um, so uh, to the parents out there, uh, please make sure that uh, the children that are coming from another household, parents or the, the, the adults in that household are doubly vaccinated and you are doubly vaccinated. I know as a parent myself, we all have a, an obligation always when we have young people come over to our houses um, it's a case of we want to make sure they're safe and, and well cared for. In, the, in, the, in an epidemic, that is obviously an issue. So make sure that you are doubly vaccinated, please. Um, I'm going to ask Dr Gale to, uh, to provide some more health information. Then I'll ask uh, Zoe Robinson to give uh, her perspective as the advocate for children and young people. And then we'll be honoured with some comments from Alyssa. I'll just indicate to my, to my uh, uh, journalistic colleagues here that uh, Alyssa has never appeared before TV cameras before or any other issue, so please uh, uh, just understand that uh, she's not experienced in doing this sort of thing, but she wants to have her say, so please acknowledge uh, that in the way that you address her. Okay, uh, to Marion Gale. Thank you. Thank you, Minister, and good morning, everybody. In the 24 hours till 8pm last night, there were 1,022 locally acquired cases of COVID-19 in New South Wales and one overseas case. Um, as the Minister said, we continue to see good testing numbers and thank you for people for coming forward um, when you have symptoms and even the mildest of symptoms. So more than 120,000 tests uh, reported till 8pm last night. Currently in hospital, we have 1,266 people with COVID-19 admitted, 244 people in intensive care, um, and 118 people who are currently requiring ventilation support. Of those 244 people in ICU, 181 haven't been uh, vaccinated, 54 people have received a first dose, and nine people have had two doses of a COVID-19 vaccine. Um, in terms of the suburbs of concern, um, similar to we've, what we've been reporting in, in previous days, we continue to urge residents of the Western Sydney and South Western Sydney areas in particular to continue the great job that you've been doing in following public health advice, getting tested, getting vaccinated. And particularly I'd ask residents of Greenacre, Guildford, Bankstown, Reevesby, Marylands, Fairfield, Liverpool, Condell Park, Auburn and Blacktown. Um, in terms of sewage, we're having uh, sewage detected in the Ballina and Wardell catchment areas of Northern New South Wales uh, local health district. And we currently are not aware of any cases in those areas. So for anybody who lives uh, in those areas, please be vigilant for symptoms. Please come forward for testing. I'd also like to take this opportunity to remind people who might be travelling from a stay-at-home area, an area under stay-at-home orders, um, to an, an area without stay-at-home orders for a reasonable excuse, that it's very important that you continue to follow those stay-at-home orders um, once you've left. So if you've travelled into, for example, a regional area that's not under stay-at-home orders, it's very important that um, you don't go out and about and in particular that you wear a mask. So a big um, plea to anybody leaving a stay at home order, um, stay at home area um, to please follow that advice. 
Uh, in terms of the deaths that we're reporting today, um, as the Minister said, we're aware of 10 people who have passed away. Six of those individuals were from southwestern Sydney, one person from western Sydney, one person from southeastern Sydney, one was a resident of northern Sydney, and one person from Sydney's northwest area. Of the 10 individuals who sadly passed away, six were not vaccinated, two people had received one dose, and two people had received two doses of a COVID-19 vaccine. Among the uh, 10 deaths that we're reporting today was a woman in her 90s from Western Sydney, who is sadly the third death linked to an outbreak at the Hardy Guildford Aged Care Facility. And she sadly passed away at Westmead Hospital. Among the 10 are also a man in his 80s from Sydney's Northwest who died at Hornsby Hospital, which is where he acquired his infection. And also among the 10 is a man in his 80s from southwestern Sydney who passed away at Concord Hospital um, and who acquired his infection at Canterbury Hospital. There have now been 255 COVID-19 related deaths in New South Wales since the 16th of June and 311 since the start of the pandemic. And on behalf of New South Wales Health, I extend my condolences to all the families of people uh, who have lost their lives to COVID-19 and in particular to the families of those 10 people um, that we are reporting today. So I'll end my comments there and um, I'll pass on to Zoe. Thank you and good morning. Thank you, Minister Hazard and thank you, Dr Gale. Uh, I too would like to extend condolences to the families um, who have lost loved ones. I also want to acknowledge the 2.5 million children and young people in New South Wales who are uniquely experiencing this pandemic. And I want to acknowledge the work that has been happening across government to ensure that the voice of children and young people is heard throughout this process. My role as the New South Wales Advocate for Children and Young People is an independent role. And our job is to bring the voice of all children and young people to government, business and community, and no more important than at this time right now. So I want to acknowledge some of the great work that's going on and especially the announcement today around this friends bubble. That is as a direct result of what children and young people have been saying, that they want to be able to see their friends, they want to be able to do it safely, and the reason they want to do that is for their own wellness and because they've really felt the uh, isolation during this period of time. And this gives them an opportunity to connect, to care for each other, to see each other in ways that they have been unable to do. So I really want to acknowledge New South Wales Health, uh, the Minister for Education for this work, and the Premier for listening to children and young people at this time and the great work that's going on across government that is directly informed by children and young people. But excitingly today, you don't just hear from adults, you have an opportunity to hear from a young person herself who's experienced this pandemic. So please, I'd like to introduce Alyssa to share some of her thoughts around the pandemic. Thank you, Zoe. I'm Alyssa and I'm in Year 9 at the moment. I'm 15 years old and I know that lockdown has been incredibly hard for everyone lately. However, children and young people definitely want to do the right thing and also be able to socialise because lockdown is incredibly isolating for everyone. Helping everyone feel connected will undoubtedly benefit their mental health in this time. And for children and young people, this will also be able to impact their studies because I know from personal experience that there is a lot of lack of motivation regarding schooling due to lockdown and not being able to see our friends. Um, children and young people at the moment want to do the right thing, but we also want to stay connected. Therefore, being able to socialise whilst also abide by the new rules through this friendship travel bubble will definitely help us all greatly at the moment. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, can I yeah, sure. You actually did a very good job there, better than the health minister. Yeah, if I... you. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Um, well, firstly, can you tell us uh, from a personal level, how hard has it been for you to not see your friends, to, ha to have homeschooling for, for term three? What's that been like for you? Well, of course, it's been very difficult not being able to socialise in person because Zoom and FaceTime can only do so much to keep you connected in times like these, um, which is why I think this new travel bubble will really help improve everyone's mental health um, and also hopefully their schooling um, regarding motivation. 
at the moment. So it's been quite difficult, but through support networks and feeling connected through Zoom, it's definitely been made easier. And there was a lot we found learning from home all of this extended period and doing so much on Zoom and, and, and online with your classes. Of course, it's difficult being on the screens all the time, but um, utilising support networks and the facilities that the school provides has definitely been helpful. I'm lucky enough to have a great school program at the moment, but I know a lot of people might not be so fortunate to have home learning um, as effective as what I have at the moment, but definitely it's um, doing pretty well at the moment, yes. What's the conversation like between you and your friends about getting vaccinated? Have you, have you been talking about getting vaccinated and, and whether you want to do it and whether you, you, you know, it, ha, have you been talking about that amongst yourselves? Um, personally, I know everyone's very, vac um, very excited to be vaccinated around me. I am double vaccinated at the moment, which is great, a great relief to know that I'm protected transitioning into going back to school and seeing people again. And I'm aware that all of my friends and family are also quite excited to be able to get vaccinated and feel safe going back into the community. Well done. Well done. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> How about that? Uh, to have people, young people like that is just amazing. And to think that our community is going to have her, probably and her friends in charge at some point. Amazing. Fantastic. Sorry. Uh, Ash. Yeah, so were there any health concerns with allowing, you know, uh, so many unvaccinated young people going into households uh, at, at of this Of course. Time? Of course there were. But, I mean, it's a balancing act. We're an epidemic and uh, everything has to be a balance. Um, the strict epidemiological views would be we all should stay somewhere away from everybody else forever. Um, but the mental health issues and the other socialisation issues, the fact that we're human beings means that there has to be a balance. And I think that's what our crisis cabinet strikes, strikes the balance. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's a challenge. I think uh, everybody in the world's felt that, that uh, if you don't want to catch the virus absolutely, then you stay hidden away from everybody. Or you take some risks and try and strike the balance, and that's what we're doing. Minister. Sorry. Um, with the, three, oh. yeah, the three children. They have to be the same for each of the three kids. I mean, like, you, your household, can they pick another two from the other household and then yeah, there's a separate three? But, but, but what happens is one, one child will actually... Uh, um, be able to choose two children and then of course in another household it would be a different setup. So there will be cumulative effects but not huge and uh, we recognise that but it's, it's the balance. And I've got to say I think uh, um, the fact that uh, both families, both adult families from which the, uh, the young people will come have to be double vaccinated um, will act as a further incentive I think for us all to make sure that uh, everybody gets double vaccinated. There's it's just a reality. If, you, if you've ever been a parent, you know that uh, what your kids want, uh, they'll pest you till they get it. And uh, I've got to say, I was pestered many times. So I'm quite sure that if I was still at that stage, I'd be pestered if I weren't getting vaccinated. And that's a good thing. Uh, sorry, yeah. There's no limit. James. There's no limit now on the distance that someone can travel for a singles bubble arrangement. Why is there a limit for kids under the friends bubble of five Ks or within the same LGA? Well, that was what the, obviously the, the uh, uh, the health team determined there should be some limits on that, and it's trying to just strike the balance. It's, it's like everything else, James. It's just a, a balancing act. And then, so if we're able to move Luke, into this, in, in, yeah, if we're able to move and have kids have play, play dates again as we sort of inch inch closer to opening up, mm -hmm. what about aged care though? Are we any closer to getting aged care visitation rights open up again? Um, you know, for people that are fully vaccinated to go and visit elderly. Yeah, look, I think that the uh, the, the aged care is a huge issue for us, and, and all of us want to go and visit. I think there'd be very few of us who wouldn't have somebody in an aged care facility that we want to visit. But obviously in, there has to be some safeguards in that regard and it comes down largely to the, to the advice that uh, is given to the aged care facilities to keep the virus out. But we certainly are getting very close, I think, to being able to have a, a freer approach to that as well. Mr. Hunter, uh, can I just do a sort of first thing? Can you? Yep. Just in relation to the bar. Even if she did insult me earlier. <laughs> 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 now we're going to get a question again. The, the, in relation to the bar and lockdown, um, the mayor up there says that they want to see a tightening of uh, the number of people who can come in uh, or who can go into those regions as well. They want to see them tested before they leave. Uh, is that something you're considering? The other point he's made is that they say that they have a real problem with supply on vaccines. Could you yeah. also address that? Look, I think we've got to look at all options, but uh, I think there, there is some genuine... Uh, there's a degree of hesitancy, obviously, in the northern area, but there's also, I think, some genuine concerns that uh, um, the vaccine availability has not been what it was but, or what it could have been. And I think uh, 
Um, certainly we, we would like to see a lot more vaccine. We've been saying that to the federal government for many, many months. But the good news is uh, the Moderna vaccine will be coming, and in fact has arrived, as I understand it, uh, in most pharmacies that are actually going to take it. Um, so there'll be a lot more availability of vaccines in that area. And I would certainly encourage people um, on, in the Tweed, um, in Byron Bay and the associated areas, and of course in Kempsey, to go and get uh, your double vaccinations as soon as you humanly can. There's no question that vaccinations um, just give us a sense of freedom. Um, I, I remember very well, I'll never forget the feeling I had on the day after I'd had my second AstraZeneca shot, um, and I suddenly felt like there was a huge weight lifted off my shoulders, and I've heard other people say that. So the strong message to everybody is, go and get vaccinated and do it quickly. Have you treated the virus? Sorry, can I just do James and come to you? Uh, Ash. Okay. Did, true to the Byron case, is it a local case? It was actually somebody who had travelled... Yes, as I understand it, it was somebody who's travelled into that area with a, an appropriate permit and had actually uh, had um, uh, both a um, rapid antigen test um, and a PCR test, the rapid antigen test. It's one of the problems, we've talked about this before, rapid antigen tests which uh, um, have a certain degree of ethics or efficiency don't always show up, um, and in this case it didn't. The PCR test then showed later that uh, there was a positive case, which is good. So the, the person actually did what was needed in that sense. Um, but again, it's a balancing act as to how you deal with these things, particularly when people are going for work reasons. Do you James. Have so, sorry, Jane. Sorry, I come back to you. Is that all right? James. Further to Ashley's question, mm -hmm. has there been transmission in that area, or is it just the one case, the authorised worker from Sydney? and? What was the authorised worker doing? I mean, knowing that they weren't breaking the rules, but what work were they doing? Oh, I'm not sure about that. And obviously, that's not need, something need that to be tight, is no. particularly pertinent to anything, really. So they had a permit and they had an authorised work, but I don't know the details. Well, and had, I think there was another case. I'll ask. Yeah, um, been I'll ask uh, Dr. Gower. Would you like to tell us how many cases there are in those areas? Yeah, thanks very much. I mean, in relation to the person, uh, the case in Byron, at the moment there is just that one person. Uh, who's travelled uh, from Sydney, as the Minister said, and is in isolation uh, now in that northern New South Wales area. Um, the concern and what our local public health team are doing up there is about a number of exposures um, in the Byron Bay area, a number of shops, um, as well as some restaurants and pubs in the Tweed area as well. So I urge uh, the residents of that northern New South Wales area and Byron Bay and Tweed LGAs uh, in particular to um, have a look out for exposure venues that are listed. Um, please monitor for symptoms. Um, please uh, get vaccinated and get tested. Dr Gale, the... the updated from the positive case in Tamworth as well. Tamworth's not on the list of those areas going into lockdown. Are they in the clear? We understand the positive case is isolating on a property. Yeah, look, thank you. Um, yes, so there is a, a positive case in the Tamworth area. Um, and like for every area, we do a thorough risk assessment from a public health perspective in looking at whether uh, a return to stay at home orders uh, is needed. Um, and so in some areas there may be a case, but if they're isolated, they haven't actually um, been out and about or there is no broader exposure risk to the community, um, then uh, a return to stay at home uh, is not necessarily what we would be recommending. Oh. So it's really a suite of factors that we look at. Is there a positive case? And has actually there been any risk to the local community? And if, and if those two things are there, um, then that's when we would be uh, likely to recommend a return to stay at home. Dr Gale, the, the testing that was conducted uh, with the person who travelled to Byron, was it before mm -hmm. the Virgin flight or when they got there? Can you, can you let us know when the testing was happened? Yeah, so my understanding is that this person, as the p part of the course of their work, um, had a program of some regular testing. And I understand that the initial um, rapid antigen test and the subsequent PCR was done upon arrival in Byron. And as the Minister said, the rapid antigen test uh, was negative, but the PCR swab um, test that was taken uh, returned a positive result and hence um, the public actions, uh, public health actions have flown from was, there. Was the PCR test um, a requirement for work or was it uh, conducted for another reason? Um, I, I believe it was a, a requirement of, of the workplace, but I, I don't know the detail of that specifically. Minister? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, sure. Um, Minister, there's obviously, obviously a lot of people that have had their jab recently, so they're all waiting for their second doses. Yeah. Just in terms of supply, 
do we have enough supply? We know that those people are all definitely going to be able to get their second jabs, no problem, by, by mid-October, early October. Um, our understanding is that the availability coming through for the federal government still addresses that. They've certainly given us assurances that there's sufficient coming through for, for the second doses. Um, there's some, I think, question mark at the moment which we're still trying to resolve about whether or not the full availability will be there just more broadly as to what we were hoping, but we're not sure about that yet. What is but the that, reason the, for that's, that, though? That's, uh, I think, pretty... It's not like, that's not rocket science. The, the truth is we've been dealing with this now for about 10 months, um, nine months, 10 months, of the federal government obviously trying to get vaccines in from overseas and doing their best, I have to say. I mean, obviously they've brought it in from Poland and other places. Um, but there has to be a degree of uncertainty when you've got suppliers coming in from around the world. But is there so a terms of requirement for... No, that's right. In terms of the requirement uh, for vaccinated... Sorry, can I just deal with this first? And can you, yeah. In terms of businesses and the requirement for vaccinated staff and vaccinated customers, can you confirm if that's just for hospitality and services like hairdressers, or will it be all retail? Will bookshops and clothing stores need to have a staff member assigned to their front door checking vaccine passports? Look, all that has to be finalised, obviously, in the next few weeks. But I have to say my uh, instinctive response as Health Minister is I want everybody vaccinated. Um, and I think uh, we should be looking to try and achieve that and sending those messages strongly. Um, sorry, just Alex. Uh, no, sorry, Alex, this lady here. Um, what does this mean for the border bubble with Queensland? Will authorised workers still be allowed to cross in that northern New South Wales area? Um, well, New South Wales hasn't restricted anything on our border. In fact, we've maintained our borders open for the majority of the time, very small period, I think, with Victoria at one stage. So the bubble that exists and the border that exists, or I should say the, the, the border that was put in place was put in place on our northern border by Queensland, um, and the bubble uh, was negotiated with, uh, obviously, New South Wales by the Queensland Government, for which we're grateful. We're hoping that, obviously, the Queensland Government will continue to be flexible and reasonable for the people of the northern areas of New South Wales. Um, but that still has to be considered by the Queensland Government, not us. Have not yet, no. I have, Minister, Minister. I, have, I have regular discussions, I must say. I think uh, um, regular discussions with uh, the Queensland Health Minister and the Victorian Health Minister. Um, we all share information all the time. And I'll try and have a chat to her later today about that issue, but I just haven't had a chance this morning. Minister, yeah, Minister. Sorry, Ursula, and then you, Ash. Oh. And then, Al oh, sorry, Alex. Yeah, we, we, we consider, uh, and will you make vaccinations mandatory for MPs in state parliament returning in October? Um, why, if not, why not? I mean, given you've done it for other industries. Look, it's possible, it's possible to do it under the health orders, is my um, understanding. Um, my personal view is that uh, all MPs should be vaccinated. I'm strongly of the view that MPs coming into the parliament from all over the state should be role models for the rest of the state, and they should be vaccinated. Um, I... Uh, whether or not that would be necessary through a health order or through legislation, I think is still probably under uh, some consideration. The Speaker of the Parliament would be uh, doing some work on that. I think you need to address some of those questions to the Speaker. I know I have been told, I haven't had direct discussions with him about that at this point, but I've been told he's certainly looking at those issues. But my strong view, as I said, my strong view is uh, members of Parliament should be the role models for the rest of the, the community. So it is quite possible and they should mandatory. get vaccinated. Sorry, I actually said Ursula, Ash, and then you, James. Ursula. So when we, um, well, just hold it for a sec. Okay. Ursula. When, when we hit 70%, there, there are regional areas where right now unvaccinated people can do everything. They can go to retail stores because they're not in lockdown, so yep. they can do everything. When we hit 70%, yep. what happens to unvaccinated people in those areas? Do they get restrictions imposed upon them? Look, those issues, I think, it's fair to say, are still being sorted through, Ursula. But I couldn't give you a definite answer on that at this stage. But certainly, the measures that are taken to ensure that people who are double vaccinated are able to move around is because we're trying to keep the rest of the community safe. So, again, the message is, yeah, obviously, we have to work those out. It's a difficult issue, but uh, go and get vaccinated. It will solve the problem. Ash? Just in terms of mandatory uh, vaccines for healthcare workers, I'm not sure if you know about this case, but there's a paramedic in the Riverina who says that he's been stood aside from work effective immediately because he's challenged the mandatory vaccination. Is that something we can expect to see moving forward if you don't meet the deadline and, and healthcare workers don't want to get vaccinated? Um, I think I know the case you're talking about, but I wasn't familiar with what you just said. Um, but I think it's fair to say that 
the directions and health orders that were put in place requiring all health workers to be vaccinated are there for good reason. They're there because of an obligation that health workers have to their colleagues to keep them safe. They're there because they have an obligation to patients, um, a duty of care to those patients to keep them safe. And I think that if people are refusing just for the sake of refusing, then the consequences um, have to be very clear. And at this stage, I haven't had those discussions with the, uh, the health management in terms of either that case or more broadly. But certainly I would expect there to be steps taken to ensure that the orders that have been made are backed in. Uh, but that may be, in some cases, it may be that for various reasons, people may have very valid reasons, they could have health reasons. And I would expect that health will there will strike a balance on those people and they would be uh, presumably moved away from frontline work. But I can't comment specifically on that case Minister, um, Minister, sorry, can I just go? I just this is asked a couple of times when I come here. Please. Community sport, um, obviously, mm. there are clubs saying that they're going to go under because they can't. Cricket's due to start back up. Um, when we get to seventy percent, or even when we get to eighty percent, are we going to be able to restart community sport? You know, I've got to say to you that um, I'm very keen to see um, community sport resume. I actually had discussions, I've had numerous discussions with uh, Minister Ward, who represents uh, the community or sport more broadly, um, and. Uh, I've indicated to her that uh, I think that it would be appropriate to have more discussions directly with the senior health officials, um, so Dr Chan's team, and we're going to facilitate that in the next few days and see what we can do um, to try and uh, persuade uh, public health that uh, it's appropriate. I think there are many uh, environments where you'd have to say, if you're outside, for example, um, playing uh, cricket um, or playing softball or baseball or all the other sports that you play outside, you're in the fresh air. It's one of the safest environments you can be. And we had the similar problem, similar issues last year um, when we had uh, the non-Delta variant. Um, and in the end, it was uh, worked through COVID safe plans. Um, I would think we will, we will get there very soon, but uh, it's been worked on. And is that 80% or 70%? Do you, do you um, think it's more there's of There's been no, no decision taken on that um, at all. But my view as health minister is I'd like to see community support. Again, it's a bit like what Alyssa was talking about before, mental health, uh, socialisation, all of those things have to be struck in a balanced way. So as Health Minister, um, I won't be strongly arguing against community support. I'll be arguing to support community support, but in a COVID safe way. Minister. Um, and that's going on at the present time. Uh, sorry, yes. Hello. Um, there is a situation unfolding right now at uh, the CFMEU in Melbourne with protests. Mm. There's a police presence right now in, in Piermont. Just a comment if I can about that. I think it's very disappointing that any union would take such a strong position anti-vaccinations. Um, I think the reality is we need to be vaccinated. It's a worldwide issue that we need to be vaccinated. And I'd certainly ask uh, uh, the union um, involved to be supportive in the strongest possible terms. But I'd also ask those members who thought it was okay to go out and uh, disrupt the community and do things which are completely unacceptable yesterday in Melbourne um, to rethink their actions. Those sort of violent activities, are just, they, they have no place in Australian society, none at all. Um, if they have a view, express it courteously and privately, sorry, pri courteously and publicly if they wish, um, and express it to their union, but don't behave the way they did yesterday. It was actually appalling. Minister, so, at seven. And, and could I say, just, I'll just say this, that in dealing with the unions here in New South Wales thus far, the unions here have expressed a variety of views, but they've done it courteously and politely and uh, I think that's uh, a more appropriate way to go. James, and then I'll come to you. A couple of things on a 70% roadmap, right? When are we going to see the health orders that will enact the 70% roadmap? Because we're only 18 days away from reaching that target. You're always to trying to get ahead of yourself, COVID James. Well, always they, trying to get us in. Rules need to be made. I would like to do it, and but it's still being worked through. And I'm sorry. And These things are complex and they need to be worked and through. And further to that, yep. the current projections have us hitting 80% 10 days after that, after we get to 70%. This 70% roadmap only deals with the freeze that we'll get at 70%, not 80%. When are you going to work out what we're going to get at 80%? We are actually working on it. I mean, obviously, you'd be surprised to know that the, uh, the cabinet, crisis cabinet meets regularly and these discussions ta are taking place all the time. Our public health team, Dr Gale, Dr Chant, Dr Broom, are all involved and the broader health team are all working on it. Um, but you're, you're almost saying that in a negative sense, that there might be only 10 days between 70% and 80%. I think it's fantastic. Um, and it's amazing, and I want to thank the community again for doing that. 
But we are aware of that and we are looking at what the options are. And can I just clarify as well, um, you suggested that there is a question mark over whether people in non-lockdown areas, unvaccinated people who can now go to the pub, will need to go back into lockdown if they're not vaccinated by the time we well, get I'm to 70%. Suggesting. What is I'm that saying correct? is we'll look at all those issues and sort them through. They haven't been sorted through yet. Listen. Minister, at 70% and beyond, what's going to be the practice for fully vaccinated people who become a close or a casual contact? Will they still have to isolate? Actually, that's a, a good question. And again, that's been part of the discussions going on in the crisis cabinet uh, team with the public health officials. Um, obviously, if people are doubly vaccinated, there are still, there are still risks, but the risks are far, far less. Um, if you've been doubly vaccinated, the risks of you getting the virus um, are far less of you getting symptoms are far less, um, of you going to hospital are far less, of you ending up in ICU are far less, and of dying are far less. But there is still a small risk. So those issues are now being sorted through with our public health team, um, the epidemiologists, the doctors, Dr Chant, uh, Dr Gale, Dr Broom, and others, and uh, taking advice uh, more broadly across from the, uh, the expert committee that the federal government has as well. So where all those issues are being worked through, but at this point uh, there's no certainty or clarity on that issue, but we will give that in adequate time. And sorry, just quickly on aged care again, just yeah. is there any chance that uh, people in aged care facilities could have visitors before we hit 70%? Is there any chance that'll be relaxed before 70%? Look, we're looking at all those issues, Lucy, but I can't give you a definite answer at this stage. Just in terms of risk. Oh, sorry, James, I'll just go to Ash and then come back to you again. Just in terms of risk, how can you reconcile that it's, you know, you can have two kids in your house that, that aren't vaccinated? but then you can't have two fully vaccinated adult visitors over at your house at, at this point. Look, it's, it's... The one thing that I think we've probably all learnt in these last 20 months of this virus is that there's no absolute certainty on any issue. Everything is a balance. and Everything is a matter of trying to prioritise uh, freeing, up, freeing us up and getting back to what we all want to get back to. And when these propositions are put uh, to the crisis cabinet, we get advice from public health, we get advice from the broader health system, the broader health family, uh, those who are interested in the mental health issues, those interested in all the other issues. And as a consequence, um, that balancing act is struck. It's not perfect. Um, and uh, I know there have been various people who at these meetings have spent a lot of time trying to pick holes in the, in the orders. Um, and I've been answering those questions now for 20 months, and I'm just saying there is no perfect. It's just it's, it's a balancing act. Well, school formals will be back. Speaking of which, James. <laughs> school, <laughs> school formals. Will, that, will school formals be on? Uh, there's no discussion on that at this stage. I mean, we're trying to... We've just managed to get a couple of kids to visit a friend, James, so there you go. Minister, Ursula. 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 Sorry, Alex, I don't know anything about it. Um, I know there have been... When you're the health minister in the middle of a pandemic, you get lots of people telling you they've got all these wonderful products to do all these wonderful things. Um, but those things have to be considered by the health experts, not by me. And I don't know at the moment what purifiers you're talking about or what is going on in that regard. The state so, parliament brought in... They talked with that legislative council plan to recirculate the air more quickly and more often. And schools are saying they're going to... from what I read in one of the esteemed newspapers, um, open the windows up and doors up to let some breeze flow through. Is that sufficient in terms of the safety of kids? I don't think that that's something I can comment on at this point. Um, we're working through those issues. Do you want to comment on that or not? Uh, Dr Gale might have a comment about Thank you. So, look, I don't know the specifics around the um, air purifiers, but certainly from a health perspective, we're working closely with education around the various settings uh, in school to make sure that those environments are as safe as they can be. And the range of measures uh, are broad and include um, very simple but important things like opening doors and windows. We know that actually natural ventilation that disperses particles in the air, it's simple but it's actually very effective. And so um, looking at having more activities outdoors, outdoor teaching, open windows, open doors, how masks are used, how school groups might be um, conducted in, in smaller subsets to reduce risk. So a whole range of factors um, at the moment uh, are being discussed between health and education and we'll continue to look at um, any other modalities that might become available. Minister, just on the 70%. Before we do that, I just, um, there was a question before about school formals. Is that, um, I'm not sure whether it's government policy, but 
obviously the advocate would like to say something on that on behalf of children and young people, so she can right. share with you whatever the views are. Um, yeah. I just wanted to raise that in the consultations we are doing with children and young people, in terms of priorities, what they are seeing is return to school as, as a priority, but also the ability to see their friends. So uh, children and young people accept that we are in the world that we're in right now, and so in terms of things that they're wanting to do, it is um, different forms of activities. And to that end, we should acknowledge that there are some incredible activities that are being designed for children and young people at this stage within understanding this friends model as well. So just to clarify that when we're asking children and young people, their first priority is to see their friends. Uh, Minister. In relation to the 70% roadmap, Victoria has obviously released theirs and it's, it's considerably weaker, if you like. There's fewer freedoms at their 70% than there are ours. Why is that discrepancy there between the two states? And are they being too cautious or are you going too far? Uh, Ursula, you would know, as do everybody else, that I've never criticised Victoria or Queensland or any other state. Everybody has to strike the balance and I'm not about to start now. Um, it's a tough gig being uh, a government or a health minister or a premier in a pandemic and they've made their decisions and uh, I'll just leave it at that. Uh, Ashley first then you James. Sorry. Obviously the Everest school race will go ahead with, with 5,000 people. Mm. Are there concerns around that and you know how strict will it be? Obviously there's, there's a lot of people in, in an area, a lot of them drunk. Um, what are the health concerns going to be around that? Um, well, obviously the crisis cabinet weighed up those issues yesterday and the, uh, suffice to say there was a lot of um, interest um, by uh, the uh, groups who were involved in the Everest to have a lot more than the, the number that has been agreed upon. And that number has been agreed upon on the basis that that is the, the likely number that would be possible in outdoor major events uh, once we get to 70%. And I think as James has pointed out, we'll be well and truly um, at 70%. So. I think that the, uh, it's again, it's, as I've said now thousands of times, it's a balancing act. Um, and I think uh, having something like the Everest is obviously uh, um, an incredible event for New South Wales. It's also something which uh, um, says to the world we're opening up and we're, we're getting back to where we want to be. So it's, it's positive. I'm hoping that uh, the organisers aren't too disappointed by the limited numbers, but I think uh, uh, the Cabinet struck a balance and it was a, a reasonable balance in the circumstances. Uh, James. Just w wanted to follow on from Alex's question earlier about Parliament. Um, you've mandated vaccines for a number of industries. You can very easily, under the public health orders, uh, implement a mandatory vaccination policy for parliamentarians uh, under the health orders. Will you do that? And if not, why not? But I just indicated to you, James, a few minutes ago, my strong view is every parliamentarian should be doubly vaccinated. So we'll and I'm in. open to that. Uh, suggestion as the Health Minister that it could be mandated, but I understand the Speaker of the Parliament, who is, um, in effect, he represents the, the democratic institution that leads the state, um, is uh, looking at those issues at the moment. And I think it's appropriate that they be allowed to look at those issues. Mm. Minister, the thing you brought today shows that the Premier's performance rating's taken a fair bit of a hit in, in recent months. How much do you think that would be pandemic related? There's obviously, obviously there's a bit of frustration I, in the community. I'm sorry, I haven't seen whoever's done this poll. What, what I will say is I think, uh, I mean, I work very closely with um, Gladys Berejiklian. and she's the most amazing person to work with. She works extremely hard. She's only doing what she thinks is right for the community. Um, and I don't, I don't think there could have been a Premier work harder or in the, more, or, or in the better interests of the state. And that's an absolute, I've been in politics a long while. She's done an amazing job. and. Uh, if uh, those polls are, as you say, well, that's unfortunate, but she's done the job that she considers appropriate, and I must say I support her 100% in the efforts that she's done, striking a balance between looking after our safety and making sure that as far as possible our state is open and that jobs are available. Um, and it's been a, a very tough gig, and I'm sure that uh, most of the community would be appreciative of the fact that we're getting very close to getting back to what we all hoped we would get to. I think it's I can see the uh, every day is hit to me as health minister seems brighter and brighter and I can't wait for everybody to get out there and enjoy the things that we used to do but the key is get vaccinated. Thank you everybody, appreciate it, thank you very much and thank you to, just formally to Alyssa, I mean amazing, so thank you very much for that, you're incredible, um, yeah well done and thank you to our Auslander people as well and thank you to all of you, thank you. Thank you.